Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm Kathy Wrigling with Orange Audubon Society, and tonight we're going to talk about how your students can participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count coming up. This program is brought to you in uh, coordination with the Cornell K-12 Education Program. They have a lot of great resources. Be sure to check out their website. Also being brought to you with uh, from Orange Audubon Society and our mission is to promote public understanding of and interest in wildlife and the environment that supports it. So the Great Backyard Bird Count is coming up um, February 14th through the 17th. And this count is a global count. And here's some statistics just to give you an idea of the participation from last year. So there's over 10,900 species of birds and last year over uh, about 72% of those species were counted on this bird count. Um, 210 countries or subregions participated. There was over 384,000 eBird checklists, um, 164,000 plus photos and videos were added and uh, approximately 60, 642,000 uh, people around the world participated in this. So your students can be part of that. So why participate? Well, it's important to make sure your local birds are counted because no one's gonna be counting them on your campus except you. It gives us a long-term record of birds. Scientists can't be everywhere. And it's a great way to involve students in authentic science. And what do we learn from these counts? Well, we learn about migration patterns, year-to-year -year changes, and long-term trends. And the Great Backyard Bird Count starts midnight on February 14th, and it runs through 11.59 on February 17th for those people that count the owls and things like that. So where do you count? You can count backyards, you can count schools, city streets, parks, nature centers, eBird hotspots. So it doesn't have to be a backyard at all. What do you do in the backyard bird count? You count birds anywhere for at least 15 minutes. That's the important thing. It has to be 15 minutes. You can count longer. Um, you need to keep track of the time and your best estimate on the number of individuals for each type of bird that's observed and we'll go over some of the specifics of that. So here's some things to do before February 14th. You want to look for places to find birds ahead of time. So look for places that would have some type of food that the birds would like to eat, like here are some um, types of seeds that birds are coming to. You want to look for water source. You, you want to look for places like trees where birds can find shelter. You want to decide on a time. Now, ideally, it's best to count in the morning. Birds are much more active in the morning. You want to create a free account on eBird. Um, it's very easy to do. You just go to the website, eBird.org. And once you create this free account, it also lets you access a whole lot of resources from the Cornell Lab. So uh, it's, it's a very great resource. Choose a bird ID resource so that help you identify birds. Now, a great one to try is Merlin, which is free, and it's an app, and I highly recommend it. We'll talk a little bit about how to use it. You can use paper field guides. They work great. And if your media center doesn't have any, they're easily available um, online and you can get them for well under, you know, $20. They might be $15, $10, something like that. So you might wonder, well, how do we learn to identify birds? As long as you, you know, have the resources, you can learn to identify your local birds that are around. So you want to teach your students some basics of bird identification, which is size, shape, color, and behavior. 
So one thing, when you see a bird at your school, you want to consider how big it was. Is it small like a sparrow? Is it in between a sparrow and a robin? Is it in between a robin and a crow? Or is it in between a crow and a goose? And then you want to think about what category bird it is. So is it a woodpecker? Is it a bird of prey? Is it a songbird, which is probably the most likely types of bird you're going to see? You know, it could be an owl, a duck, a goose, a gull. And the main colors that you see on the bird. And it's important to note what the bird was doing. It might be soaring in the air. It might be in trees or bushes. It might be hopping on the ground. That's going to help you identify it too. So if you use the Merlin app, this is these are the questions the app asks you. And so if you do use Merlin, once you put your best answers to these questions on what you've seen, what's going to happen is that it's going to provide you a list. So I put in, I saw a small bird that was brown and white. And you might say, well, why did it bring up red winged blackbird? Because the females are brown and white. So this gives you options and you might see a photo and say, yeah, that's my bird. And then you can click on it. This is your bird, or then you have the identification. Now at this point for the Great Backyard Bird Count, if you have younger students, this is where you can stop. You can say, yep, yeah, this is my bird, and you can save it with Merlin. But that doesn't go into the scientific count. So if you want it to go in the scientific count, you, it can go directly to eBird from here. That's an option with younger students. With older students, you should go beyond this. If you don't use Merlin, you can use a field guide to go through and try to identify the bird. Another tip, because the count is another week away, you could have some time to let students either individually or in a group identify, uh, learn about the local birds that you might see, and they can become an expert. They can, you know, draw a picture and write descriptions. And that way, if you see that bird while you're on the count, they'll know it and they'll be able to identify it and help the whole class. Um, so here's a good example. This student had the palm warbler. So on the day of the count, look how close their picture is. They knew what that bird was. So here's uh, one school's version of their focus bird. They had to write the name of the species, create a scientific drawing, um, label field marks, like things like it has a white eyebrow. Um, they could describe the sound and they could write other notes if, if you wanted. So here's a cool way on using um, Merlin. It can generate a list of your common birds. That way you kind of know what to look for. So if you open the Merlin app and there's um, three lines and you click Explore Birds, hit the slider to set your local. Uh, so you're going to, you know, my local birds and then you put winter and then it's going to generate the most common birds for that for your location for that time of year. And here's an example. I did this and I just did a screenshot. So these are common birds in central Florida. Um, and this is a bar chart showing like, OK, they start <laughs> they start moving north here in May. So we won't see them here. And then some of these birds they're here all the time, as you can see, but you can see the palm warbler and the yellow rump won't be here all year. Prior to the count date, decide how you're going to submit your data. You can use Merlin, but it really doesn't go into the uh, Great Backyard Bird Count, but it gives your students practice. Or you can use eBird and then your data will go in to the whole data collection of the Great Backyard Bird Count. So again, to use Merlin, you go through the steps of, you know, going through the questions. And then when you find your bird, you can say save with Merlin and it'll go there. 
and then you'll have a record for yourself of what was seen. To do, use eBird, and you can use eBird without having the mobile app. Mobile app makes it a lot easier though. Um, you can record your eBird data directly on the website, but the app is very easy to use and the app will track the date, time, and location and distance for you. You don't have to worry about it. And you can submit it right from your device. And of course, you can use the eBird website, but you have to track your own date, time, location, and distance. So it's a little bit harder. Now, you can count any bird that's wild that you can identify by sight or sound. But if you can't identify it, don't worry about it. There's going to be birds that you can't identify. This is a bird I saw, and it was so far away and so backlit, I couldn't figure out what it was. So it just didn't get counted, and that's okay. So some birding etiquette for your students is if you're watching a bird and whatever behavior it was doing, maybe it was eating some seeds or something, um, if it stops, that means everyone's too close and you need to back away. You want to make sure to stay on trails, off private property. Don't get close to nests. If you happen to find a nest, give it a lot of space. Don't play bird calls. It stresses birds out. And remind your students, if some students are looking at a bird, they need to walk up slowly and quietly so they don't scare it away. After you submit your data, you can watch the live map on the Great Backyard Bird Count website, which is listed here. And you can watch the map light up. This is like the most powerful thing, I think, of the whole thing for students. And what, what I do with students is I don't submit the checklist until we're back in the classroom and pull up this map, which is at that website. And when you click on it, you look for where you are and they'll, they'll see a light light up. It takes a couple of minutes and it's very powerful because they're like, that's us. We submitted to this whole world effort. It's very, very exciting. So the next portion will be a tutorial on how to use the eBird mobile app. Um, if you're having trouble following this, you can go to the website uh, for the Great Backyard Bird Count, uh, www.birdcount.org, and they also have a free one-hour class on uh, the eBird website on how to use eBird. So both, both things are great resources. So eBird is a free app from Cornell Lab. And you, how you do, when you click on it, it's going to say start a checklist. You click on this bar and it starts the time. It starts the distance. And then it's going to have you choose a location. So if you click on this, it, it'll say nearby. And if you're on campus, you can just click. It'll just show your location. And when I put the description in, I put, you know, restricted access so people know oh it's a school and they can't go wandering back there to look for birds but it's not a big deal most people know not to do that and once you have your list of birds it, a list of birds will pop up you click to the left of it and you can you can add in numbers you can do it just by clicking and if you make a mistake you can click on it and just delete it and add in the correct number so it can be fixed anytime If you downloaded the Merlin app, you're going to see this little Merlin icon next to where you put the number of birds you've seen of each kind. And if you want to check the identification, you can just click to that. It'll take you to a picture of that bird on Merlin. And you can even click on Merlin and listen to the sounds to see if they match up. All right, an easy way to find a bird on the list. So let's say you find goldfinch. Instead of looking through the whole list, if you type the first few letters of that bird's name, it'll pop right up and then you can put it in. Now notice some birds have this gold square with an R. That means it's rare for your location or for the time of year. It might just be that this bird is not expected at this time. If you really, really saw it, that's okay. You can put it in and then you can make notes in there 
to let that there's a person or groups of people that monitor the website. If something unusual comes in, they'll just send you an email and say, uh, do you have other documentation? And don't worry about it. If you hit the wrong thing, it's okay. You, they can just take it off. So again, if you're confident something's rare, like I saw this uh, bird called a yellow uh, breasted chat, then you can put a description. And if you have a picture, that's even better. So when you finish the count, look over your numbers because sometimes, you know, my fingers sometimes hit instead of three, it'll say 30 or 300. I always check to make sure everything looks right. I check to make sure I didn't accidentally click on a bird that I didn't mean to. And you can go fix it before you submit it. And if you forgot to put a location, you can click on it. You can pick your location from the map. If you're birding at a local park or something, when you click on um, close by, it'll come up with a list of names. And if it has like a little fire symbol, that's a hot spot. And you want to try to choose those when you can because that's uh, a major area where people do bird lists and they want to keep all the data together. All right, next slide. All right, if you can wait, submit the list in your classroom and they can watch the map light up. If you plan to do multiple counts throughout the day, stop the list and then do a new one, like if you have different classes and things like that. So you don't wanna keep one for the whole day. You wanna stop it in between doing different groups of students. So if, does anyone have any questions? You can put them in the chat. And while we're waiting for that, we'll go ahead onto the next slide. So our next webinar coming up will be March 5th. And we'll, we'll be discussing how to improve your school habitat for nature study. So you might do the great backyard bird count and your students might be like, well, we don't have a whole lot of birds. And this can help you create better habitat so maybe that you can provide some more places for birds to visit especially that spring we get into migration so we want to have lots of places for the migrating birds to stop and rest so i'm going to stop the recording let's see where it is okay I'm trying to find it <laughs> anyways does anyone have any questions at this time Right there it is.